recording started. That. Welcome to Photography Chat with Merlin. Photography Chat with Merlin. Welcome to another episode of The Chat. We're uh, Season 3, Episode 14, and we have uh, Kate uh, with us here. Do you want to take a second to introduce yourself to everyone? Um, Sure, sure. My name is Katya Gasparovic. You can call me Kate. Um, I'm a photographer. My um, uh, passion, and uh, I'm trying to make it still. (laughs) Sorry. So... I'm a film photographer. That's my main focus, my love, my, um, you know, magic, which made me do photography in general. So, um, what else? Uh, I'm a mother. I'm, uh, I did a bunch of uh, entrepreneurial things. And lately in my life, I found this passion and I'm very happy about it now. So I'm like trying to, especially in these hard times, I'm trying to, you know, it's also my healer, so to find a new, uh, you know, place in life. I I can relate to it being a healing thing, too. Like, that's what I use photography for is a lot of, like, mental health stuff and and everything. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I don't know how people can survive without hobby or something which will really bring them joy, you know. Yeah, so th- that's a really important thing. Um, I-, I work in tech, and um, when I first started doing like the more theoretical side of it, um, one of my bosses told me the importance of finding a tangible outlet because all of this work we do on like paper and computers and in things where we're not actually building stuff is really unhealthy for human beings. And if you don't have a tangible outlet where you can create and you can feel rewarded by something, um, your mental health is really going to suffer. And uh, I didn't understand it when he told it to me. It uh, took a couple of years for it to steep in my mind before I was Mm -hmm. like, oh, that's what he meant. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I totally agree to that. And I must say, I envy to those people uh, whose job is actually that passion or joy. So that's a perfect combination, and that's probably the best outcome for any person in life. (laughs) Absolutely. So how how did you find photography? Oh, uh, it was a pure accident, even that um, I had, like, probably, like, early in my life, I was this close to get into photography, but I guess it was the right time. But... You know, now I feel really bad that I wasn't uh, introduced earlier. And uh, it was um, it was uh, in 2016, I think, a friend of mine, very good friend. He's a Georgian artist. He, sh- he, he showed me his uh, uh, Twilands camera. I think it was Rolleiflex. And I immediately fell in love with the old mechanism, the look, the weight, the all these noises and clicks, you know? And then um, when I developed my first role, I was like, whoa, that, that's that's what I want to do, you know? So... Yeah, those twin, yeah. Re- th- those twin lens reflexes are a really cool camera. Yeah. I have now one of my own. It's Yashica. Okay. Yeah, I've got a, a Mamiya C33. Yeah, it's it's a absolute mm. tank of a camera. Yeah, very good one. Yes. Um, so you went straight into like film photography then. You didn't like do digital first or anything, just like you found film and just fell in love with it and ran with it or um Marilyn, I just wanna ask, is it on my Yeah, I have a little bit of uh uh connection problems. Is it on my side or like do do I need to do something about it? Um you're 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 okay now. You were cutting out a little bit there before, but um, you're coming in. You're okay. coming in now. Okay. Well, I heard. Your, yeah. Okay. Okay. I heard your question. Yeah, and um, 
you know, uh, I kind of, from that generation when, uh, when I was growing, the film was already out of picture and digital was kicking in and um, I wasn't, uh, you know, I had a couple of cameras and I, it, I didn't, you know, I, I, I didn't feel any of that, like all the images I felt were flat to me. So I didn't, I don't know, maybe, you know, again, it wasn't the right, right time for me. So with digital photography, I didn't have any connection. And also uh, like, you know, all these camera, set, camera settings uh, and everything like, super tech things uh, kind of, you know, freaking me out. So it's not just freaking me out. I'm not fluent with this. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have a good results and I kind of didn't get involved. And then when I uh, tried the film camera, I'm like, whoa, that's what, like, I was like, oh my God, I could, use, I could do that, you know, 20 years early if uh, somebody showed me. But it was already gone. Yeah. Especially that I grew up near Japan and, you know, all the modern stuff came to us uh, from Japan, and it was, of course, like this progressive things like digital cameras, but they, they were not interested to me. That's cool. I, I can I can relate to that a lot to uh, myself. Like, I do shoot digital for some things, but um, I don't know. I, I just find a little bit more of a connection with, with like film, not just because of like what you get from the film itself, but also just the relationship with the cameras. Like I, I like those older cameras. Um, mm -hmm. It just has a different feel to it. And also when you're, you're shooting with other people, you get a different response with, with mm -hmm. those older cameras sometimes. And also the whole process, I totally agree with you. <clears throat> the whole process and what I love about, um, film cameras is that uh you know i don't like um, spending time uh, at laptop and the edit in photoshop uh and again maybe because i don't use it uh like the way it should uh, it should be but still because i don't like this post-production process all these manipulations it's not interesting to me to take uh, shots with digital and then work on them i prefer like to you know set up everything and uh, when you when you do set up everything right, then you have uh, something amazing, which uh, pr I think uh, that uh, digital images would never be able to achieve, even after a bunch of manipulations. I still feel the difference. And even if you didn't do the right job and it's a pure accident, that could be also a very interesting result. So that kind of surprise element also excites me. The, the surprise is an interesting one. So... Um, my, my nieces and nephews are, are pretty young. They're like in like six or seven years old. And, um, the last time I was home visiting them, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I, I bought them some like reusable disposable cameras. And I said, uh, you know, this weekend we're going to play a game. Like M uncle Merlin has one of these disposable cameras. You guys have one and we're just going to take a bunch of pictures all weekend. And then when it's all done, I'll get them developed and then we can jump on a Zoom call and look at your pictures. I'm also going to make them a little book um, about all the pictures they took, but they don't know the book is coming. Uh, that's a surprise for them. Um, but my nephew, he is just full of piss and vinegar, and um, he, he'll he just go 100 miles an hour without thinking what direction he's heading in. And he goes tearing off with this little plastic camera. And I remember hearing his mom say, be careful out there with it. You don't want to drop it. And he's like, it'll be fine. And he's like, just waving it around all over the place. And then I hear just hellacious crying like 15 minutes later. And, uh, he had tripped and smashed the camera on the ground and, um, popped the film back. <laughs> and he's just yeah. like, uncle Merlin's going to hate me. And he's <laughs> like, I ruined all the pictures. I don't know. He said, I let the pictures out of the camera. <laughs> Like, yeah. Bummer. No. Well, and he was like, he was all upset about it. And I'm like, dude, I don't hate you, but I'm like, you've also maybe created something interesting because who knows what these light leaks are going to do. And I was like, that's just part of the medium. Like, it's not perfect. Yep. And yep. then he got all excited about it. And now he wants to see what kind of crazy art he's created with it. And I, I, 
I was looking at the film that came back from them and he's a hell of a little photographer for like a little six year old ripping around with the plastic camera. Some of his pictures were really impressive. Yeah, I mean, that's the beauty of it. So even the person who doesn't know how to use it can do something really crazy or beautiful or interesting, you know. Well, and he surprised me too, because he kept doing this because I gave him a digital camera last year and he likes taking selfies with it. That's his favorite thing. And he has to <laughs> announce it every time he'll have the camera. out. He's like, selfie. <laughs> he, he's running around with the film camera and he's like, selfie. And he's got these tiny little arms. And I'm like, dude, I don't think your arm is long enough for the minimum focus distance for the camera. Stop doing well, selfies. But his selfies worked out. So, you know, I yeah, learned something new. The selfies, you know, you can't take your selfies out of them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Yeah. Mm, so how long has it been? Like, how long have you been uh, doing photography for now? <sighs> so it's been in, a, in and out, even that, you know, I wish it would be a full-time job, but... Uh, it was my hobby for a couple of years and then I decided to took it like on a seriously different level and I wanted to go and get my master's degree in, in fine art photography. So I started taking prerequisites because my first education not related. So I started taking prerequisites in, uh, here in New York in Hunter College and I was uh, like going to apply but then uh, COVID happened and uh, you know. The, the rest of the story, you know, we were all locked down at home, and uh, yeah, I couldn't continue studying, and then basically just come. Oh, so sorry, my dog broke <laughs> some noises, and uh, Mishka, and uh, so yeah, I'm like basically starting all over again this year, but mm, I decided to postpone a little bit of study. Oh, I mean, yeah, because I'm like. Um, you know, being busy with a lot of projects. <laughs> it's uh, being busy is good, though. It is good. It is good. That's yeah. very cool. So I was curious, like, what, um, what is like something that that interests you when you're taking your photos? Because I, I noticed, like, there the uh, samples you sent me. Um, there was a really interesting range to them, and um, you know, some really really creative stuff that uh, that you did there too. Uh, well, yeah, I, you probably noticed that, that I can't even, um, you know, identify myself as a, that or a photographer or that photographer. I'm just trying all different things and uh, see, like, what, um, you know, what direction to take, I guess. But still, no matter what I'm doing, I find my most inspiration in, the, in uh, nature and uh, people, of course, and mostly women, I guess, just because, I mean, it's interesting for me to work with guys, but it's just like my circle and my lifestyle um, uh, kind of, you know, narrowed down to most of my friends, girlfriends, and uh, myself. That's my field, basically. <laughs> Nature and female bodies. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love it. Even though they're all different, though, there, there is like a, there's a cohesiveness to them. Like they all have this, um, this kind of dreamy quality to them that you can see through the photos, which was something that I, I really liked. The one that I found curious though, were the, um, the wardrobe photos. So mm -hmm. what was, what was, um, the thought with, with that shoot? Like what was, um, what gave you the idea to oh, do that one? You mean the, uh, the like the closet, like a box? Yeah, the closet, and then the person's wearing the mask. Yep, yep, yep. yep. So that's an interesting question because, um, so that was my school project. It was it called uh, Safe Space, and it's funny because uh, I, I mean, funny, not funny, but still interesting. I find it interesting because it, I was shooting it right before the uh, pandemic happened, and I basically um, decided to uh, take a one photograph or like so basically one photograph each day during the year me being in that uh it's a japanese traditional wardrobe it's just the when i saw it it just you know i buy a little uh sometimes some um, furniture at some thrift stores uh so that uh, was 
but specifically because I just was fell in love with the, how it looks and how it gives me inspiration to do something about it. So I immediately put myself inside and I decided like, what if um, I'm gonna do uh, <laughs> selfies in this closet uh, during the year every day? Uh, because, you know, 365 uh, um, posters, uh, to make in such a close space, it's kind of challenging. And, uh, you know, the mood is different every day. So I thought it would be an interesting challenge and project. So I started doing that. And um, in two months, uh, uh, so I call it safe space. And who knew that in a couple of months, uh, everybody would be kind of locked in a safe space. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, my family moved in with me uh, in the house and uh, because like it was a bunch of people and I couldn't, uh, you know, do this thing uh, naked anymore. So my, my project was over, <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I still uh, did a lot of shooting uh, and that's where that those pictures came from. That's really cool. Um... I, I mean, not about like the COVID sort of ruining your project part, but um, yeah, it's just the whole chest and everything. But the the mask, like what um, ah, the mask. was the idea with the mask? Well, first of all, I didn't think that the COVID happened in my project. It's just, you know, interesting that I locked myself two months earlier than everybody. And, um, you know, uh, mask. Uh, Mask, it's an interesting accessoire I like to use because um, uh, so I do a lot of self-portraits just because it's easier for me to work with uh, my body when to work with somebody else's because I have some uh, ideas which sometimes I hesitate people to ask to do for me or, you know, also because we were far away and, um, I mean, from friends and... Uh, even strangers uh, in during this lockdown. So, so, but I don't feel comfortable to shoot myself like straightforward using my face. So this mm. map kind of gives me uh, freedom to create more, which I would do without it. And um, as I mentioned, I grew up near Japan and uh, I like very much was influenced by this country by its culture. So when I saw this mask again in a thrift store, I kind of fell in love immediately and I felt the connection, I guess. So I got it, then I use it from time to time in uh, different settings. Okay. Yeah. So. That's a cool mask. I, Cause I liked the, I saw that you also used it in the forest and that shoot looked really yeah. interesting too. Yeah. It's like life uh, ongoing uh, project. I'm gonna use it probably a million more times uh, cause I really love how it looks and how I feel in this and the result as well. Oh, that's cool. So most of your work then is self-portraiture? Well, my, it's not most, but probably made like really big part of my, you know, big part of my art. That's interesting. Even though I'm shifting from that because now uh, we get this freedom finally to communicate with people and um, I also met interesting people and uh, one of my friends, uh, uh, we got connected and she helps me a lot. So we basically collab collaborating on our projects and uh, now instead of using my body, I'm using her body because finally I found a person who would go and naked in the woods without being scared of uh, snakes or, you know, ticks. Or she would go in a cold water. So she would do all the things I would do, but nobody else. So but now it's a little bit easier for me. Well, that's fun. So you found a, like a muse of sorts that uh, that you collaborate well with. Definitely. She's my muse and she's my collaborator. And uh, I really appreciate that she welcomes all of my uh, sometimes crazy ideas. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Finally, I found somebody yeah, who is really helping me to realize my... <laughs> vision does um does she ever like bring interesting ideas into the mix too or is it just uh the ideas that uh, that you're working with well she kind of 
takes her part and uh, I don't know, maybe later she would uh, bring something of hers, but mostly we discuss all, uh, like we, if, before every shooting we discuss what will going on. So sometimes we would just, you know, uh, brainstorm together, but mostly I'm the generator. Well, that's cool. And <laughs> is there like anything that you, you like draw from for your ideas that like, you know, you find, um, kind of like inspires you or um, directs the, the kind of stuff that you want to experiment or play with? Well, yeah, I mean, it uh, happens all the time. Uh, sometimes I walk in the woods and I see some interesting location and I have immediately image in my head. Or, uh, for example, I have a friend also here in Woodstock. Uh, she's the owner of... Um, uh, vintage clothing store and she has amazing taste and collection from you know Victorian era and sometimes she um, let me borrow some interesting clothing before I was buying all the stuff I like uh, to shoot but then I realized and I came to her straightforward and say you know what I would probably be broke if I buy everything I want to shoot with so maybe maybe you can help me to you know borrow so and she loves my art thank god and she she really happy to help me so sometimes i go through her wardrobe and uh, find something for shoes there that's really awesome yeah that is really awesome <laughs> so how, how are you liking woodstock because i remember you mentioned before you were living in in new york city so what is the transition going from like you know one of the busiest cities in the world to uh, going to the middle of like kind of nowhere yeah, that's a good question as well. But also, like, to me, it's super logical. I am, um, I live in New York for probably eight years before we before I moved here, and before that, I lived in another mega palace uh, like Moscow for sixteen years. And originally, I'm like from super provincial little town, forest of Russia, um, actually island. And, um, you know, I ran away from there when I graduated school and I was really, you know, looking forward to never come back and just live my big city life, uh, you know. And then, um, I don't know what happened. Probably I got overwhelmed because, you know, New York is a very dynamic city and a lot of going on there. And sometimes, um, you know, some, like first, I don't know, five years I was so in love, I couldn't just get enough of the city and i wouldn't imagine that uh, years later i would be so overwhelmed that uh you know uh you know not you know hope to you know have a more calm life i guess yeah and um so yeah luckily uh we were going to find this house to, for for weekends and uh we got the house in Woodstock because my husband he loves uh, this area. He used to own another house here. So, and I was familiar with this area. I also liked it a lot. It may, it, the nature here is just fantastic, you know. And um, so when we got the house, it wasn't even a question. I was just like immediately <laughs> out from Brooklyn and <laughs> moved here. And ever since living here, pretty happy. That's awesome. Yeah, and well, it yeah, I mean, saying like what inspires me, I, for me, it's really hard to find. Uh, I mean, even it's the most pictures probably city in the world still because I'm <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm into nature, for me, it was hard to uh, even and the whole the whole process of my work, it's like I need it's basically staged, so I need time, I need you know, all these components to build the frame and everything. And it's the best place. It's right here besides my house. That's amazing that you kind of have this like big photographic playground in your backyard. I feel so blessed and I'm really like, you know, grateful to my husband that he made it possible because yeah, that's my, first of all, it's my stage, but also, uh, my dad and him built a dark room for me, so I, it's like mini mini uh, production here. I mean, I can shoot immediately, go to my dark room, uh, process, develop film, and see the results right away without you know going to the city or sending rolls anywhere. So I love 
what I have and I really, really So you, you do it. you do all your own processing then? Yes. Oh wow, it's for color in black and white? No, I mean color I have a place in Brooklyn where I send this okay. um, and rolls, yeah. But black and white I do myself, yeah. That's cool. Yeah, yeah I, I still haven't made the leap to develop my own color yet. You know, one of these days I'll try. Well, you have a lot to do. By the way, congratulations on your new studio. It looks amazing. Thank you. It's yeah. it's really coming together. It's hard to like pick up um, the the filming setup to show um, show what it looks like. But um, yeah, it's it's. Um, it's come together really well, and the community here is really interesting. Um, there's, I think, um, 70 different units here, and it used to be an old motel. So, and it looks like an old motel, and there's still sketchy people that come here and want to rent rooms and don't realize that it's it's not a hotel anymore. Um, wow! So they think it's a pretty cool building. Yeah, it's it's a really cool building. It has a very storied history. There's been a ton of murders here, uh, oh. so it's like it it has um, some some history to it. Um, I don't think anyone died in my room. I hope so. Um, you know, I got that going for me. Uh, but the community here is really cool. Like, there's I've met people who are tattoo artists. There's some textile people. Uh, industrial designers, fashion designers, photographers, um, videographers, painters. Awesome. Like there, it's just a large spectrum of people, and it's just wild. Like the the people that are here too. So right before uh, I came on to do the chat, mm -hmm. I was picking up some uh, some V flats from a, a friend in, in the other building, and uh, he's like, "Oh, meet these people here." And one of the girls he was talking to, I went to high school with her, like, 30 years ago. <laughs> and I haven't seen her since high school. And she's less like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm Shirai. And I was just like, I knew a girl named that in, in Kimberly. And she's like, holy shit, that's wow. me. <laughs> so you just ended up coincidentally being, uh, sharing, like, basically one building? Well, so it, it, there's two buildings here. So there's like oh. the main building, and then there's a second building. And um, she does uh, film directing, and she's in. Wow. She has like a little like editing studio in in the other building. And I'm like, that's so fucking random that I haven't seen you in like twenty odd years, and here you are. Small world. It it is an absolutely small world. Um, yeah, it's just and it's been really cool because there's lots of interesting people here, and so I'm curious to see what um, kind of events and things will happen um, as as the year goes on. Like part of the programming is going to be done through um, there's an organization here in Vancouver called Vancouver Mural Fest, and mm -hmm. they put together a bunch of um, like they run a yearly. <clears throat> mural festival where they um get uh, businesses that'll like you know sort of donate their walls to be painted by different muralists and uh the property developer that runs this building has partnered with mural fest to help with uh, programming and one of the things they're going to do is um they're going to paint murals all over the buildings in the parking lot <laughs> so i'm I'm curious how it's going to turn out because it could either be really, really cool or it's just going to look really janky. <laughs> sure it's been, I mean, I think it's cool. I have a friend who does murals in Florida. Uh, it's something amazing. So, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's going to be great. Yeah, my, my partner's roommate, um, she does crazy mural stuff. Like she was living in Berlin for a while and then moved back here because of COVID. Um, and, and yeah, she's done some really, really cool mural stuff. Like it, it's wild. Like what the mural artists do, just the scale that they work at is, yeah. is phenomenal. True. 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 I agree. Excuse me. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's, I don't know. It's been fun. I've got a Polaroid wall or I, well, it's not really, it's a door. So like the front door to my studio is, is becoming a Polaroid door. So anytime someone visits for the first time they get their Polaroid up on the door mm -hmm. and um, just not quite halfway full yet. So it's, it's getting there. It's, it's picking up some steam. So yeah. it's okay. 
Yeah, I, I just had, I have the last thing left is the dark room. I've been really procrastinating on building the bathroom out into the dark room just because it took so much time and money to get the mm-hmm. rest of the studio space done that, uh, you know, I moved some stuff in and started using it. And I was just like, all right, we're good. <laughs> well, there's the bathroom and the priority. <laughs> Yeah, it, it'll get there. But uh, in the other week, too, I, I picked up a uh, a large format color laser printer. So it, it's um, like a office thing. It looks like a fucking photocopier. Mm-hmm. Um, but it'll do 11 by 17 color uh, printouts. And uh, so I'm planning on doing some, some zines with it this year and then making some really big wheat pastes, like blowing up some pictures to be like, you know, a couple feet by a couple feet to uh, paste up around Vancouver and um, probably some lo-fi stickers and stuff. So that'll be fun too. Great. Yeah, that's awesome. That's yeah. good. Happy for you. Thank you. You'll have to come visit sometime. Well, yeah, I've mentioned already that it was on my list. Uh, I mean, the Vancouver I want to visit for a long time. So... As soon as um, I let you know, as soon as I'm like, I know that I'm going. And the weather's just starting to get nicer, so it's it's a good time to come to Vancouver here soon. It's it's getting there. All right, all right. I'll I'll, I'll think of it. I'm just you know I don't know um, after this um, super low phase uh, when I didn't create uh, during the COVID and everything. So now I feel like I'm finally back in uh full of um, energy and i got myself a bunch of ideas i'm working on so i feel like i need to keep up and um, create a body of work yeah that's really exciting like so what what are if you if you can share what are some of the ideas that you have floating around that you want to work on well yeah i was working actually uh, i was working like the last couple of months from, from last year, I was working on a big project, uh, which I was very excited about uh, to go this year. But unfortunately, due to due to the war, uh, like all the plans has been changed and um, it's not happening now. It was about, uh, uh, as I said, I'm from this little island in um, Pacific Ocean, north of Japan, and uh, we still have um, the natives there. They live completely different life, but they're still there, and they are dying nation, and uh, they don't have these people anymore anywhere in the whole world. So I was thinking to go and shoot um, their lifestyle, their portraits, everything, what I could, you know, get, and possibly made a book and a show about it. And I don't know, for now, it's, I hope that it's going to be just postponed and not canceled. But mm-hmm. this year definitely not going to happen. And um, uh, another project, uh, which also supposed to happen there. Sorry about that. I, I bumped my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> And also, I was going there with my collaborator, the, the friend I, I mentioned before, uh, because we were going to shoot the project uh, called uh, Wild Woman. Due to the uniqueness of this uh, land, uh, and uh, there are a bunch of different islands around, uh, and the nature is pretty, pretty rare and unique there. So I was like going to shoot this project with her there. But since it's not happening, first I was like really sad and everything, but uh, I realized that I need to just readjust. And uh, now we're shooting this project here in the US uh, called Wild Woman. Uh, so that's one thing. And um, another project, it's um, it's just that I hope that in August I'm gonna have a show here in Woodstock and uh, um, it also will be a celebration of nature and women and um, that's another work what I'm doing right now that's really cool mm-hmm. that that book you're talking like the first idea you were talking about 
is it just going to be photographs or were you thinking of also maybe like interviewing the people there and like maybe trying to collect some stories to put in? Cause like, like you said, they're dying off. That could be really interesting to collect some stories to go along with the photographs to sort of preserve them. Absolutely. Like, uh, originally I was even too ambitious to, um, to think that I'm going to shoot the film. It was like the idea to was going to there and, uh, make a documentary about these people. Uh, but then I got real and I understood that it's probably like something, mm, I would rather do what I know, uh, the best way or something I don't know the, like the, mediocre level quality you know so i decided to go and shoot the photographs but my friend uh, which i mentioned she's uh, a writer herself so she was go and uh, we, we were thinking to uh to eventually to create a show and uh print a book so the photographs would be by me and the text would be by her it's not it's not, it's mostly a photographic book, but still we were going to, of course, include some information and story about these people. Yeah, that was the plan. That's really cool. Yeah, it, it'd be cool if you like if if um, you have found a translator or something that could like get some stories from the elders and and they, capture they, that. They completely lucified. They look um, Asian, but. Um, I met I met them personally myself when I was a 15 and 16 year old girl because we would travel. My island is uh, 1,000 kilometers uh, long and uh, it's a very narrow, narrow island. So uh, my parents are they're very adventurous and they love road trips. So we would go to the north because they have um, uh, not they, they the island is very rich by natural resources. So we had um, the uh thermal thermals right thermal energy yeah yeah so we would go there to live like it's basically a camping it's like live wildlife and also you know take a little bit care of uh, health and just you know enjoy uh the nature and adventure oh so, hot spring yeah that's what okay. yeah <laughs> so uh on the way back we would always uh, find um the village or the people and leave uh, all the provision what we had uh, to them and you know talk a little bit and spend time with them and I was fascinated when I met them for the first time of my life the lifestyle what they had it was completely um, you know ancient and even that um, me myself lived a pretty simple life because uh, you know even that the island surrounded by water my whole life till um, 18 years old till I moved to Moscow. We didn't have hot water. We had only cold water two hours in the morning, two hours in the evening. That's all. And sometimes oh. it down the electricity. And even for the girl who lived like this, uh, for me it was shocking to see how they lived, you know? So it was, uh, it left huge impact on me and uh, uh, so when I got into photography, I started thinking a lot about, you know, coming back. Because when I left my island, I left for good. And I wasn't even thinking about going back ever again. Even that I have my relatives there. Not my close relatives. My parents also moved close to Moscow. But I also have, like, other relatives there. But I never considered going back until I got into photography. And then I was like, I, I have to go. I must go there. And, um, you know... Uh, so I took my dad, and in 2019 we went there, kind of a test drive, and uh, something happened. Something clicked inside me, and I felt bad that I didn't come for a long time. It was a really short trip, and I realized immediately that that's what I have to do. I need to go back. I need to shoot everything, and nature, and people, and especially that ancient people. So. That's like I kind of like find the goal, you know. It's good to have a goal like that, though, and that that sounds like yeah. a really fascinating project. Mm hmm. I even um, I even got myself um, because I was talking a lot about this to people, and uh, somebody recently mentioned this amazing book. Accident, like coincidentally, I got it just today. Uh, it's called uh, "Before They Pass Away." Have you ever heard? No, I haven't. 
So me too. I just learned it like a couple of weeks ago. And this is a, a book about uh, dying tribes uh, all over the world. And uh, there is a map here. And, um, you know, there are locations where all these people which are portrayed in this book um, located. And there is nothing about uh, the Nifs. That's the, the nation called Nifhi. Uh, nothing about them yet there. And I realize again, as I, I read it as a signal that my door is still open. I got to do this, you know? Well, hopefully that opens up soon so you can explore that project. I mean, who knows now? It's really hard to, you know, as they say, when a make uh god love make plans so <laughs> yeah i mean that's definitely been the theme of the last couple of years right <laughs> so so many plans gone wrong like there was uh yeah <laughs> yeah especially due to the recent events i mean I'm wearing traditional Ukrainian blouse. I don't know if you mentioned, but I really want no. To that that uh, is a very cool blouse. Yes, that's a super traditional Ukrainian blouse, and um, I just want to say that I tr I like fully support Ukraine, and I'm deeply disappointed, but what, by what's going on in Russia, and like it's devastating, you know. It it really is. It's um, yeah something else like i don't know what that guy is thinking it is beyond comprehension and um, i really can't understand how that could happen in this modern life you know in this modern well the the, the problem is people we're we're kind of dicks to each other like um what's going on in Ukraine is absolutely tragic, but, um, like we, we have terrible things happening here in Canada, even against the indigenous people here in Canada, where, you know, our government is still committing genocide against them and is not supporting them. And, um, it's just not really talked about much, but it's still actively happening today where, you know, the residential school system may not exist here in Canada, but, um, they are still stealing children away from indigenous families, just using the foster care system instead of um, the, the residential school program. And, you know, we're going on 40 years now where most reservations in Canada haven't had clean drinking water and they've been having boil orders. And the government just keeps saying that there's no money to um, fix the water. But then the wild thing is there's... A, a, a trust fund for the indigenous people here in Canada that's worth hundreds of billions of dollars. That's money that was set aside by the crown in colonial times for them taking the land away. But for some reason, they don't let them access it. So it's like, we don't have money to help you. But the Canadian government has used that trust fund several times to fund um, infrastructure projects for the rest of Canada. But, um, you know, they, they won't spend any money to help give them clean water. They won't respect um, injunctions from the court to you know, stop uh, logging in old, uh, old growth forests here in B.C. Um, they don't respect injunctions that have been given for them not to go into, like, pipeline areas where, you know, the RCMP and the Canadian government have been told by the courts, no, you can't do that. And then they're still going in there and attacking indigenous people and trying to take things away from them. So it's, there's terrible injustices happening all over the world right now. You know, it's going on in Syria as well. Like, it's just awful. I know, I know. I was thinking about it, uh, uh, that, you know, that they just realized before, before this year, I kind of still believe that, uh, good with the eventually win over evil but this year i really find that finally i guess grew up or lose my um glasses and i really scared that uh, not necessarily always or maybe even the other way around you know so 
Well, I think there there's a, a degree of um, if people don't do anything, it's really easy for evil to win. And like Ukraine is an interesting example of of people fighting back. Um, like I, from what I gathered, it seems like Putin thought attacking Ukraine would be a very easy win. And uh, he could just go in there and, you know, flatten the country and take it over. And he's seen the absolute opposite of that reaction. And, exactly. um, you know, it's been incredible to watch the resiliency of the Ukrainian people and um, to watch, like, their their leader. Like, a, a guy who was a comedian that people made fun of him. Like, you know, as like, you know, here's like a joke as a prime minister um, being probably one of the, the better world leaders we've seen in a really long time, actually like fighting side by like, I, I can't remember the last time you've seen on, on the news, like an, an actual president who's like not in a security detail, yeah. who's like sitting there with his men, breaking bread with them, fighting next to them. And it's not just there for a photo op. And then he's like in a secured truck being pulled away somewhere like that. I find really fascinating, but it's also it's been heartbreaking too to see the racism come out of that as well too is like you know well there's this injustice being done to the people of that country there's also this extreme exposure of people being racist to other people who are marginalized and need help and uh you know that's that's left me in a really weird spot where it's like i want to be supportive of it but then it's also like but they're being racist to people that need help and that's not cool either. So it's like a really, it's, it's a really weird duality that's happening over there right now. It's just heartbreaking. You know? I, uh, I don't know. I'm like speechless basically when I read the news and, um, yeah, it is like, um, but it's also been kind of funny watching oligarchs get screwed over. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's another side. It's just like, I don't really care about them. But I mean, it feels like a little bit justice, but still, they'll be fine, you know. But yeah. hundreds of people won't. And, and that's, that's just... Yeah, it, it, it is, it's kind of... There, there isn't even a word strong enough for how awful it is that, you know, he's he's killed, like, you know, children and, like, civilians and, and all this stuff for no real apparent reason other than um, nobody likes him there. So it's just like, you know, his ego got broken, so now he needs to go, like, you know, wave his dick around like he's the biggest dick in town, um, which is absolute bullshit. But I have enjoyed watching the videos of people banding together mm. and fighting. Like, there's one video floating around of, like, all these women um, and children breaking up styrofoam to make napalm. <laughs> it's like, that's pretty freaking amazing. Like, I don't think if Canada was under attack that we would band together like that in in such a way where we could like turn our differences aside for the most part and just like you know unify together to to fight against something that that was challenging us like i mean there's well, a group of, oh, no, let's, yeah let's not happen uh, let's not ho- let's hope it's never gonna happen and you will we will not find out but also ukraine is a small country and uh, people united by same values uh, and uh, kind of makes sense that they all united and um, also they're all humans uh, in meaning that in Russia, you know, <laughs> while I lived there, I met so many inhumans. So that's sad. Yeah, it it seems like the the Soviet propaganda machine is still alive and well, and it never really turned it, off. It, it's it, apparently it never died. You know, yeah. that's what I learned that, you know, it's already, what is it? 30, <laughs> more than 30 years, but still it's not enough. 
yeah, I, I, I dated a woman who grew up in, um, in Soviet Ukraine and the stories she had of, of her childhood there were just mind boggling. Like, uh, I, I couldn't imagine living in, in like conditions like that with, with that much of like an authority and kind of like dominance in your life. Um, yeah. Well, really, because I, I still, I grew up in Soviet Union and it collapsed when I was in, you know, seventh grade. So I still remember, I still, um, uh, it still had an impact on me uh, as I was growing and, uh, you know, forming. So it's really fresh. Wow. Yeah. I, I couldn't imagine what that would be like as a seven-year-old to, like, be around for for something dismantling like that. Yeah. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't experience that. <laughs> Yeah, well, and I mean, that, that's something that is, um, I think about it a lot, is the privilege I've, I've had, you know, being able to grow up in, in Canada. And, um, you know, we, we definitely have our, um, we definitely have our own crimes against humanity that we've committed here. Um, but for the most part, they've shielded the individual citizens pretty well from that. So much so that most people don't even know the really terrible things this this country has done to exist, like most colonial nations. Like you know, I don't think there's a single colonial uh, nation out there that doesn't have blood on their hands, somewhere uh, down the line. Um, but yeah, it's just I think about like how lucky I was with with my childhood and like you know kids my age in other countries having a very different reality. Um, but still like being able like to come to another or live in their own country and not be a piece of shit to another person, <laughs> despite what they've gone through. Like, that's something I find interesting is like, I've met so many entitled douchebags from my country that feel like they have had injustices done against them because of minor inconveniences versus like, you know, people who have like been imprisoned in other countries for something that they never did, but like they just got picked up by that law enforcement and they're like, now you're going to jail for 10 years or, you know, like the threat of like, you know, being murdered all the time by like a, extreme violence going on, but yet they can still be decent human beings despite what they went through. Well, that I have plenty examples of that because, um, you know, I'm, uh, uh, my ancestors, like my grandma, she was in pri- she was sent to prison to this island after the Second World War. Uh, right, uh, you know, all the prisons uh, on the big land of Russia were full. So Stalin sent people just to die in this island, and he created the whole prison out of this island, which were never populated by Russians, but it was kind of discovered by Russians, so it belonged to Russia. And she just sent people there to, you know, to live the rest of their life. That's how my grandmother ended up there and my father was born there. And uh, they were not criminal, they were political criminals. Mm. And uh, so it means decent people because, you know, and that's, uh, I grew up among um, those people. And um, when I moved to Moscow, I was uh, surprised by how many assholes I met there. Uh, actually from my land was really kind and um, you know soul you know having soul and even that uh, they had the hardest life in their land with no conditions to live and they still stayed people with big heart and uh, you know good kind soul so that it's like all over the world I guess yeah like it's it. I think it's just part of the human condition for sure um, I think like how you respond to that though really speaks volumes about like the character of person you are, and um, sadly, it just seems there's a lot of like bad character out there now, um, which is really disheartening, and um, yeah, I'm just kind of hoping like 
on the tail end of all of this COVID stuff, as um, we start to get in front of it a bit more and, um, you know, things open up that we're faced with a bit of like a, a cultural resonance, uh, uh, a, a cultural like renaissance of sorts where, um, you know, more creative people can, um, can help shape what the world's going to look like. You know, that would be nice. Marilyn, do you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you there. Because I lost, believe it or not, we have a storm going on. And uh, oh, no. it was an outage. So I lost you for a sec. I mean, not for a sec. I, I basically didn't hear what you said. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I was just saying that I hope, like, um, on the other side of, of this COVID thing, like, when we get in front of it a bit more, that um, we we enter like a, a new like cultural renaissance or something where it's like more of the creative people, um, more like, you know, free thinkers, more community comes out of it. Um, cause I, I've, I've definitely noticed and other people have, have commented on it that, um, you know, COVID definitely exposed a lack of community that so many of us have, like where it's just, we don't have a connection to other people and, you know, other like interests or things that open up our minds to, to other stuff. So I, I really hope that we see a bit more of that. And, you know, from that, we can get away from this sort of like selfish dickery that has been causing all of this like awfulness the last little bit. Cause it's just like you, you boil it down. Like, you know, what's happening like all the bad things that are happening in the world is just cause like someone decided to be a dick to another person. And then it just escalated from there. Well, I'm, uh, I'm like with age more and more pessimistic about society and people. And, um, I don't know, but definitely we need some Renaissance. And, um, uh, I mean, if it's happening, I'm super happy. I don't feel it this way. I feel the other, the opposite. That it's kind of like <laughs> massive degradation. I kind of think. But maybe I'm wrong, and I well, hope I'm. I don't think you're wrong though. No Effects called it in their album "The Decline," and um, I, like I mean, North American society as we know it has been in a decline for several decades now. It's just like you know, fucking swishing down a toilet right now. Um, and I don't know if there's a way to save like society as a complete whole, but I think it's possible for those of us that don't have our heads completely up our asses um, to glom on to other like-minded people and try and enjoy whatever's left of all of this and make some cool stuff and like create some interesting experiences and moments. Cause I mean, it doesn't matter how much money you have or how much stuff you have or, or whatever, like the most valuable thing, any of us have in this world is, is time. And, um, you know, I, I think you, the richness that you have is really defined by how you choose to spend that time. And, and the thing that's wild with time is, um, we're only given so much in, in our lives and we have no idea how much of it we were given. So it's like, I, I see so many people just squander the time that they have and Mm -hmm. don't realize how infinitely valuable it is. Like it's, it's the one thing that no matter, like I could win $400 million tomorrow and I couldn't buy a second more time with all of that money. Totally. Totally. I totally agree. That's why I decided like also because of this uh, war going on and like so many changes and, uh, I saw, I was thinking a lot, so I basically came up with the idea that what can I do is just like be the ambassador of light and kindness. And I personally decided for myself to try to enjoy whatever left and try to bring people only, you know, good vibe. And uh, if I, if I will make um, someone happy or smile with my art, that would be a great award. And if I would uh, be able to somebody teach something, you know, kind and just, you know, whatever light and uh, educational to bring to anybody, I think that's, that's, I, that I will be happy about. I mean, what else left? 
Well, I mean, I gotta say, your your work definitely gave me a smile. Like when when I looked through that Google Drive you sent me, I was really blown away because like the work that you post online is is fantastic as well. But um, this like the the stuff that you shared, I was like. I wish I could post some of it without Instagram shitting all over me. So like, I appreciate you sharing that with me because it was really cool to see that side of your work. Um, it was very, very striking and I, I appreciate you. it a lot. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your interest and I appreciate your, um, compliments and that you invite me to have this conversation. It's actually my first interview ever, and especially in uh, not my native language, so I was a little bit nervous about. But yeah, it was really great talking to you. Yeah, you've done amazing. Um, I, I wouldn't have guessed that this wasn't your first language. Um, <laughs> so you've you've done excellent, and it was a lot of fun chatting with you. And um, yeah, I really look forward to coming to visit Vancouver, showing you around if, if you get a chance to come up here. And uh, I really look forward to seeing um, how these projects you've mentioned go, because I think I'm, I'm very curious, especially about the the f like photo book story one. Uh, but the Wild Woman one also sounds really, really fun. Yeah, thank you so much. I will keep you posted on the, my progress and definitely let you know when I when I'm going to visit your city. Definitely. Well, I mean, I what's that? I wasn't, even, I wasn't even considering to go and study in uh, the university in Vancouver, the Emily Carr Institute. So, Emily Carr has had a fantastic photo program for, for quite some time. Um, one of my friends, Henry, he was a photo teacher there from, I think, the late 80s, early 90s, all the way up until 2014. Yeah, yeah, I heard a lot about, I mean, good stuff about it, this university. Well, for now, I pause. It's not like end decision with study. I really would love to, I love to learn and I would love to learn from people because I'm, I have difficulty studying online. So mm. for, it's important to learn from people. And uh, yeah, I was going, so now it's on pause, but who knows, maybe it will happen. Well, you, all things in their time. Yeah, yeah. It's just a lot going on, and I'm really happy that I have a purpose and um, something to look forward to. And especially that recently I learned uh, the new technique. I, I'm into uh, alternative processes, so little recently learned uh, platinum palladium. Whoa! Yes, and that's a perfect combination for me because. Uh, when I was a teenager, I used to draw, I mean, paint, and uh, I graduated, um, you know, kids' art school, and uh, I was into it for a long time, but I just couldn't do it because I, I couldn't make money with those, with this, and um, so it wasn't like, you know, on the, in, in the, how you said, like, I couldn't do it anyway, so the painting uh, elements and photography which meets in platinum platinum technique it's a perfect match uh, for someone who would still nostal uh, you know feel it's nostalgic about painting so that's uh, also like I'm looking forward to because I'm thinking to uh, the show I talked about uh, in Woodstock uh, I want to do in platinum platinum that'd be really cool yeah well, you'll have to let me know when that show's coming up. If I can work it out, I'll try to go down to New York. Well, hopefully August. So if you have um, plans or so you don't have plans, then maybe don't make them yet. So, yeah, hopefully August. I mean, it's it's what we agreed on. Nice. Well, keep me uh, keep me tuned in on that. I would love to check it out. And, Absolutely. You know, thanks again for hanging out with me. I really appreciate your time and everyone coming Thank out here. And uh, I hope the storm isn't too crazy. No, no, it's fine. And I'm, I'm used to it. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> Thank awesome. you, Mel. Well, I hope you have a good night. I'm going to uh, let Mr. Mocha walk us out here. All right. And, uh, yeah, next week uh, we're going to have uh, Daniel Rodrigue, um, one of the founders of the Instant Film Society, joining us um, out of Denton, Texas. Um, you have fantastic dude i miss him a lot i haven't seen him in 
two years now. The last time was San Francisco, March 2020, during Policon Bay Area. So I hope to catch up with them. Uh, well, not only next week, but um, in September down in Texas again. So, um, yeah, thanks for hanging out with me, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Kate. It was really great to meet you virtually and look forward to meeting you in person. Likewise. Have right. a great night. You Bye, too. everybody. Take care.